So my particular area of research that I've spent most of my time uh, over the last uh, 10 or 12 years is, has been investigating the way eye, eye movement control, the way we look at things, can tell us, can provide us very rich experience, uh, information about the, the brain. And the, why, the reason I got into this area is that what's shown in, in this schematic are all of these all of these structures in, in the brain, uh, every one of these plays an important role in determining what you look at. So essentially, almost your entire brain has some role to play in where your eyes go in your, in your visual world. And what you also may uh, recognize is that a lot of these structures, uh, the cerebellum, parietal cortex, the frontal lobes, this is that part that uh, allows us to think uh, and uh, guides our decision making and our attention and our ability to interact with our world in a flexible way. Uh, these structures, which have critical roles in play, to play in controlling eye movements and what we look at, are also amongst the structures which are differentially vulnerable to being injured by prenatal alcohol exposure. So from a theoretical perspective, we had, we had uh, good reason to believe that eye movement control could be a, a way of looking at brain function or dysfunction in this population. So we have here uh, our simplest task, which we call the, the pro-saccad task. And a saccad is simply the coordinated movement of your eyes to a visual target. Your eyes move constantly. You, you do this about 150,000 times a day. Uh, and it's to move your eyes to center the fovea of your eyes, which is the, the point of highest visual acuity on different visual targets in your environment. And when you fixate on things, you start to extract visual information from examining them. So our eyes move constantly towards visual targets in our environment. And so we can model this, we can do experiments on it, simply by asking our participants and young kids will do this, to look at a screen in which there is going to be a central fixation point, uh, and at some uh, period of, uh, of time, a target is going to appear out in either the left or the right of, of the screen. So off in the periphery of their vision, something is going to appear. So, so think of it as you're sitting, you know, you're sitting idly looking out the window in your home, your office, and a bird flies by, that's a new visual stimulus in your environment, and your eyes are automatically going to be drawn to that new visual target. Um, and so we can ask participants to simply make a saccad, a coordinated movement of their eyes towards this new visual target that appears. And this is automatic, it's driven by the sensory information that appears. We can do the opposite, we can do what we call the anti-saccad. And in this version, the participants are asked that when something suddenly appears, when this visual target appears over here on the left, or sorry, your left, my right, uh, we want you to look to the opposite direction. As we want you to suppress that automatic, sensory-driven response to look to this, this new visual stimulus and instead look away. That requires much higher orders of cognitive function and brain control. You have to suppress an automatic response and do something opposite. So people who have uh, impulsivity challenges make lots of mistakes in, in this task because they, they have difficulty suppressing uh, that automatic response. So this is where the, the, the sensory stimulus and the response is, are incompatible and we need, uh, and this brings in these frontal lobes, these, these parts of the brain that allow us to interact flexibly with our environment. Okay get a lot of information uh, out of this simple visual task. And some of these are listed here when uh, this is this central fixation where they're looking here and then a target appears and they make a saccade towards it. Like any motor movement, when you initiate a motor movement, I go to pick up this glass, the first part of this, you know, you can't, you're not aware of it, but the first part of it was over here or over there. And as I reach for the glass, your brain is monitoring the efficiency of that motor movement and constantly making minor adjustments to try to get the hand to the target 
as accurately and efficiently as possible. Well, the eyes are the same. When your eyes move towards a visual target, there's this constant online monitoring, of just how efficient that movement is. Uh, so there's a, there's a, we can measure the velocity of the eye movement, we can measure its amplitude, uh, where, where does that first saccade land? This is this inaccuracy of the, the path, trying to get the eyes towards as close to this visual target as possible. So we can measure the, the, the accuracy, the initial launch angle, how close uh, the, the, the eyes get to the target, uh, and then we can measure behavioral measures. How long does it take uh, the, the participant to react to this new visual stimulus? And then how many times do they make mistakes? So this is uh, 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 some kids performing this uh, task, the anti saccade task. Again, we're asking them to suppress that automatic response. Something happens here, look over here. And so all kids, all individuals, uh, will make mistakes. Very young kids, under the age of about five, really can't do this task. Uh, they make almost 100% errors. And it's not because they don't understand, it's because the frontal lobes of the brain, which allow us to suppress those impulsive behaviors, has not developed in those young children. Young children are impulsive not because they're misbehaving, it's because the part of the brain that allows them to control impulsive behavior hasn't developed yet. And if I'd known that when my kids were younger, I would have been a much better father. <laughs> so we know they understand. People will make mistakes in this task, but they understand because you can see they rapidly correct. And the, the time frame of this, this is happening within 10 to 50 milliseconds uh, of, of them re realizing you're not even consciously aware you've made a mistake, but you, you, you correct. Okay, so this is uh, a child with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And again, many, many studies have replicated this, and in this task, kids with ADHD will make many more mistakes than typically developing children because they have problems. There's some dysfunction in the frontal lobes that allow them to control behavior. This is uh, a child with FASD doing the same thing, doing the same task. You don't even have to analyze this to understand that there's something different going on here. And uh, we've, we've now, we've done these, these same tasks with hundreds of children uh, recruited from across Canada. Uh, and I've done similar studies in South Africa. I'm doing one now in Australia. Uh, and we find the exact same types of behaviors. Uh, many more mistakes they do correct, uh, but they tend to make their mistakes at longer reaction times. Uh, and some things I'm going to point out, you can see there's Incredible variability in the, in the amplitude of these saccades, uh, these eye movements, uh, and I want to come back to that. So, as I said, we collect lots and lots of information. We can extract a lot of information about how the brain is working. I don't know if I can go backwards. There we go. So this is, this is essentially a picture a visual representation of how the brain is working, uh, or not working, as the case may be. So all of these, these different pieces of information that we can get, and it takes about five minutes to, to do this task with a, with a child. Typical seven, eight-year-old, uh, we can collect all of this information, both pro saccades and anti-saccades, in about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we let them watch movies while we collect a whole bunch of other information, and that they're much more interested in those. But in, in a large group of children, uh, their, their reaction times are slower. They make a lot of anticipatory saccades. And kids with FASD will guess where that target is going to be. Uh, they, they say their accuracy of getting towards a, a target uh, or getting where the eyes are supposed to go is, uh, is uh, uh, they, they're all over the place. And so they have to make a lot of additional little small corrective uh, saccades to try to get themselves, get their eyes to the target. They're slower. The velocity of their eye movements is much slower. Uh, and these, this endpoint, this is this me measurement of error. Uh, and this happens in both anti saccad and pro saccad. So kids with FASD, and I'm going to show you later the adults with FASD, look to a visual target, their eyes don't get there. They're, they're making a lot of, of errors in that motor response to get the eyes to a visual target. So why should you care? 
Actually, difficulty, wait, sorry, when you look at something, when your eyes are actually moving, you can't extract information from your environment. It's only when your eyes stop and fixate on a target then you do that you start to extract information from what you're looking at. So if your eyes don't get to the visual target in your environment, you're not going to efficiently extract information about that target. And maybe it won't shock you to, to, to hear that that type of problem is associated with difficulty learning to read. Because they can't get their eyes to focus or get to a point where they can actually see letters and words efficiently. And so it takes much more practice and repetition for them to actually extract information that they can then encode in a memory and use. So there are very practical implications for some of these deficits.